All right. Welcome back, everyone, for another round of Dostoevsky discussion. We're reading uh, Book 12 of Brothers Karamazov, A Judicial Error, Part 2, um, which is technically the ending of the book before the epilogue. Um, and we are few in numbers tonight, but um, making up for it with heart. Um, so... This was probably our shortest reading ever, <laughs> maybe except the first week. Um, and it's basically just the defense attorney's um, arguments. Um, I personally was relieved <laughs> to have a short reading um, on Sunday. But uh, I think it's a pretty eloquent section. Like, the guy is definitely a great, great orator, despite, despite denying it several times in a kind of, like, token i have to say this to prove that i'm a great orator type way <laughs> um so uh we we spent a lot of time on the prosecutor last week um and dostoevsky spends a lot of time on these two guys so it seems like it must be important for some reason obviously there's a lot of plot here but um I'm really curious to hear everyone's thoughts on whether there's any uh, any more profound uh, considerations going on here. So uh, we start with chapter 11. There was no money. There was no robbery. And uh, this is kind of the beginning of his speech. And the... Mick G, not to interrupt, but we started with chapter 10. I guess Ooh. Stick with chapter 10. 10. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about, the defense attorney's speech. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, that's where he makes his introductory remarks. <laughs> um, sort of to the effect that uh, while well, the prosecutor has delved deep in psychology, that could really go either way, and he can do psychology too. They stick with two ends, he calls it. So uh, I'll open it up for observations. Uh, I, I kind of like the scene setting here after we've gotten the, uh, uh, the prosecutor's speech and we've got this kind of uh, antsy crowd here who've been anticipating this sort of um, celebrity attorney, um, <laughs> which again, as Melissa pointed out last week, is kind of familiar in this day and age. In, um, in reading chapter 10, it, uh, my th thought came uh, about the psychology is, um, is a stick with two ends or whatever, is similar to the, how the author was talking about medicine, um, in that, uh, that these are not sources of truth, and that these are things that can be manipulated or are, um, you know, at best, just not capital T truth. Um, are you are you referring to the three doctors' testimony, which all contradicted yeah. each other? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the doctor was an oaf throughout the book, hers and tuber, whatever. Oh, he's a good guy, but he's a complete, you know, incompetent um, oaf at, at practicing medicine. And then him and the other two doctors in the testimony are, you know, give three different answers. And now here's psychology, this new, you know, science of the mind as you know completely malleable manipulatable and um you know this you know he kind of is calling the prosecutor pompous or arrogant or something um at least in suggestion and kind of demeans psychology i you know it's not not central to the plot of it necessarily but it's um you know, in a book with so many religious uh, themes and arguments, um, it seems like that this is at least a corollary to that, that medicine and psychology are not, and, you know, these new uh, developments in society aren't where truth come from, at least according to the author. That's what I felt like. I don't know. That's a really interesting pointer, and I'm glad you, you know, that's, I, I really like that you dug that out of that, because it's not, you know, it's not overtly observed. It's definitely kind of a, a stream that's there, but you got to, pay attention to it. So I think that's pretty insightful. 
Thank you. Uh, the essence of his argument, though, was why kill Fyodor and then fuss over Gregory. I think that was the more important part to the argument he's trying to build, <clears throat> to the jurors at least. I really appreciated um, this week's reading because we talked last week about how reading the prosecutor's speech was so painful because it was it went completely contradictory to what you know we as the audience were already privy to what had actually happened, um, and so I really appreciated that here the um, the defense attorney was able to paint like, hey, the prosecutor doesn't have. Um, doesn't have like the complete idea, doesn't have the only story. Like he presented it in his speech as this is the only way this could have happened. This is the only way this makes sense. And I really appreciated the defense attorney flipping that and saying, no, it could make sense a completely different way. And also acknowledging, I don't remember if he did in this first chapter in the introductory remarks, but acknowledging that everything is telling a story, which we talked about quite a bit last week. Um, I didn't um I didn't actually get out of it what what Aaron was just saying about how um how psychology and medicine aren't infallible truths but I really like that uh I really like that piece of it now I'm kind of sad that I didn't come up with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's a really smart reading I think um I didn't notice that either um I got one <laughs> <laughs> 14 weeks, but I got it. <laughs> well, and I do think, you know, if, if they're, like I said, we the author spends a lot of time on these two guys. So it's like maybe we're supposed to maybe notice something important here. And maybe one of the questions is um, what, what, how do we make sense of reality and how do we get to the bottom of things or what is true and how do we make judgments about, you know, um, the, the conflicting stories that people tell um, and the whole the whole narrative has been or the whole book has been conflicting worldviews and and different you know sort of personal narratives and and um, all sort of thrown in a maelstrom together you know uh, so it, it's it's interesting that several things get put forward as evidence but you know, maybe ring a little hollow and I think the process or the defense attorney is doing a good job at exposing some of the things that are and aren't reliable you know or that could be used in multiple different ways it's like a tool but you know it's kind of ambiguous how it's applied um, I do totally agree with Ginny that it's like sort of a relief to re read <laughs> a different account um, a different narrative. Um, I, I, I think as much as we kind of hate the prosecutor for being exposed to, you know, facts that he's not aware of, um, his narrative is coherent. Like the story he paints is kind of compelling, you know, and then all this, uh, at least for me, and maybe I'm just a sucker who like, I'm like, that makes sense. But now that makes sense, you know? <laughs> Uh, I'm glad I'm not on this jury, <laughs> um, but it is sort of um, vindicating to have the defense attorney present an alternate account that's completely coherent and that also pokes a lot of holes in um, in what seemed like an almost airtight argument, you know of the uh, prosecutor, uh, at least if you don't know the details of the case or, or the back, you know, the backstory that we've gotten. Um, and I, I think the thing I appreciate about this opening chapter is how the, as how Fetyukovich explains how he got interested in the case and started to track it even in the newspaper. And even then he was like, hmm, I'm not sure things add up quite here. And I, you know, uh, you guys mentioned one of the important parts uh, of of evidence. Um, 
I forget what I think Ginny made a point about what you know one of the important pieces of evidence he presented. I forgot what it was. I don't remember what I said. Or was it Aaron? But anyway, like another important piece of evidence here, or or part of his argument, which he he just sets out from the beginning. He's like, this isn't good oratory, but I'm just going to tell you my big argument here is while the totality looks very damning. There's not one single piece of evidence that holds up under scrutiny or can't be quest called into question. There's like nothing rock solid when you look at them one at a time. Um, and uh, I guess that's a huge relief after <laughs> with, with the narrative, the kind of irony, the dramatic irony of the audience already knowing some things that happen that these guys don't. Um, it's, it's like really refreshing to see the defense attorney getting some of it right, you know? <laughs> uh, and I think it was about Grigory, right? That uh, psychology could argue, like, you don't fuss over a man you just whacked after you killed a guy if you're trying to extinguish all the witnesses. You know, you don't, like, sit there and hold a handkerchief to his head and <laughs> you smash it again. Right, <laughs> um, and that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. It also happens to be mostly true, <laughs> based on the, the narrative that we had from a few weeks ago, from right. Rich's perspective. I did have um, one quibble with the narrator at the very beginning of this chapter on seven twenty-five, just because. Like the narrator kind of described the the whole speech and like he started like this and then he did this and then eventually there were two halves and he did this and he ended up, you know, rapturous and all this business. And then without starting a new paragraph or anything, he went straight to work and began. And it, I had to read it like three times to realize that the narrator was going back to the beginning of the speech. <laughs> he was already in raptures at this point. And I was like, yeah. hey, start a new paragraph or don't tell us about the second half of the speech till it happens or something. And I know that's a quibble, but. Well, look at these pages, though. The, the, <laughs> there aren't paragraphs. It's just straight blocks <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really notice. I mean, I assume the whole book has kind of been like, I don't think the whole book has been quite No, like that. not quite. I mean, but this is just like a one long oration, and I, I was like, it, it is. There must be no breaks in his talking. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I would agree that that a paragraph, a new paragraph, would have been in order there. <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, I was like, oh, and by the end of the speech, he was this, and then suddenly it's the beginning of the speech again. I really, I really had to read it three times. I, I think I was a little confused there too, but I was more uh, fixated on how he bends over in the middle of his back, which seems impossible. <laughs> and like, <laughs> Did anybody else sit there and try and do it? <laughs> yeah. Uh... A hundred percent. And if you didn't, yeah. you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been described as very bird-like, so he, he must have, he, it's his per peculiar physiognomy, you know. <laughs> his knees go backwards, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and for the record, he's Foghorn Lighthorn. But, uh, <laughs> I do <you> declare. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, talk about a terrible aura. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but I do think it's clever how um, he kind of demeans his his abilities in speaking. But it, it's a pretty coherent and um, fluid and eloquent speech, as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah. Um, and how he works up to a you know to a finale and everything. Uh, it's it's a lot different from the prosecutor who is sort of grandiose and and um you know overblown and florally eloquent from the beginning in a syrupy way you know <laughs> that's i mean that's a classic like politicians do that all the time i'm not like so and so i'm like you i'm not right you know. <laughs> right we could but it somehow works for him <laughs> uh shall we move to the next chapter no money, no sure. robbery. No um, problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and I think this is another example of how his or oratorical skills are um you know well polished because he kind of starts with the lesser um the the matters of like less gravity and builds up you know we start with the robbery and let's question this and then we'll talk about the murder and then we'll talk about even if there was a murder you know why he should still <laughs> let him go uh, to to Jenny's point here, this chapter has three paragraphs. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> and I feel like I, I didn't notice that. I think it's a really good catch because I was like, when I was reading this, I felt like I was like spinning in circles. <laughs> and I think maybe there's an intentional violation of what we're expecting in yeah. writing there. Uh, but I somehow also feel, I don't know about you guys, but... Um, there's somehow this background of excitement and expectation and tension from the audience that's built in nicely. Yeah. Uh, so that you're sort of just waiting for a great thing to happen. You're kind of expecting this, like this rapturous salvation moment or whatever. Um, you can feel the audience kind of eating this up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do we get that in this chapter yet? I don't, well, already in the past chapter, there were... Was there the threat to clear the room yet? <laughs> I can't remember, but th there were people laughing and clapping, uh, you yeah. know, here and there. and yeah, yeah, approving chuckles was the end of the last chapter. <laughs> I don't think the judge threatened them yet, but... <laughs> that was one of the things that I thought was uh, funny. You know, he attacks psychology and um kind of does this parallel mock psychology where he says look you can do it you know you can make any story you want to out of this um but at the same time he's employing these his oratorical skills to to like manipulate the crowd psychology and build a rapport and um like get the the audience to feel like he's the person to be trusted he's the one who has the authority uh and they you know get on board with everything that he's saying more and more and more throughout his speech yeah in ancient greece this guy would have been a superstar <laughs> like, <laughs> when rhetoric was all that mattered Uh, I actually thought he had a couple really great points here, and I had not considered these until he said them. Um, like, you feel, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but even if you know the details, uh, like we do as readers, of what Dimitri actually did, even though we didn't see kind of the crucial moments, um, there are certain facts like that suddenly make sense here. Um, I don't know. I, I let me backtrack. What I'm trying to say is, again, the prosecutor's uh, case seems fairly unassailable. There's just so much overwhelming evidence against Demetri. Like, how can he possibly be vindicated? Like, the, there's not a shred of good evidence in his defense or in his favor. You know, it starts to feel like even if we believe he's innocent, there's no way that anyone can make a case for him. You know. And it's really amazing to see this guy um, seize on a couple things that are kind of significant. Like, for instance, this money that everyone said he stole from under the bed, you know, and yet the bed is completely undisturbed, right? That's a pretty significant fact. Like, uh, also the fact that no one ever actually saw the money except Smerdyakov, you know? Um, and is this the chapter two where, where he goes into sort of, uh, an accounting of how, um, all these people who say that they saw him with $3,000, you know, there are 3000 rubles. There's like no way that actually no one's been able to come up with 3000 rubles. Like all the calculations only total up to 1500, which matches up exactly with Dimitri's story. And you're like, wow, suddenly there's... It's kind of amazing to see this guy brilliantly produce 
actual evidence in defense of Dimitri. I don't know about you guys, but I was pretty impressed by that. Yeah, didn't someone say they saw 20,000 or something? Yeah, right. That was Maximov. <laughs> I mean, yeah, human witnesses are you know, horribly unreliable. Right. Yeah, and he even brings that up. He says, you know, none of the witnesses who say they saw it, they say they saw a lot of bills. They didn't say they sat there and counted it. So, like, very unreliable. I hadn't thought of the bed either. That was a really good point. That was, yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, and then he uh, jokes about Dimitri hiding the rest of the cash in the prison somewhere. Oh, the Dungeons of Udolpho. I yes. love that. <laughs> I, that was hilarious. The first time I read that, I cracked up. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to go to the footnote because I didn't get the reference. But I just the fact that I'm like, oh, that's a fictional place. You know, like, like I just, in Cinderella's castle. <laughs> Without knowing what it was, I thought that was a really funny phrase. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have not read Anne Radcliffe gothic novels, but... Um... <laughs> Why not the Dungeons of Udolpho, gentlemen? <laughs> yeah. Because that's a pretty good point, too. You know, he's been with and around people, and... When would you have stowed this cash somewhere? I mean, that's just very much asking everyone to believe a story. There's really no evidence of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, like, how do we know that... I mean, there just because there's an envelope on the floor definitely does not prove that he took it, right? Like, he, he gives several examples of what else could have happened. It's certainly not beyond reasonable doubt by hopefully American juridical standards, I would think. <clears throat> uh, anything else in this chapter? Do you want to highlight anything? No, I think you did a really nice job of, of, of that. So, yeah, he starts with the robbery, but then we move on to the murder, and this is where things get really, you know, interesting for us. Um, it, it's it's almost like this is a little bit harder, you know. The robbery, it, it, I felt pretty convinced by the robbery thing, you know. I was like, all right, good points. No murder either. Um I really appreciated in this um, no murder that he goes to the drunken letter because that, of course, was kind of the linchpin or whatever. Yeah, in the, the turning the point. Yeah. Turning point. Um, <laughs> when Kat Katya produced the the letter, um, and I re I really like the way he kind of dis dismantled that. I mean, yes, he wrote this, but he was drunk. He was spouting off like. I think he even says, um, oftentimes children or drunken idlers leaving a tavern or quarreling with each other shout, I'll kill you, but they don't kill anyone. Like saying, I'll kill you, like he just acknowledges, like, this is something that angry people say a lot that they don't act on. So, right. And, I'll kill you, I'll kill you all. That's just, I mean, that's just classic drunk talk. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> It is classic sci-fi villain talk, but <laughs> I've never said it when I've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember if this is the chapter where uh, where he talks about Katarina changing her testimony. I think you talked about that at the end of the last chapter. Well, was it? A little bit. Um, Brings her up a couple times. Because he talked about um, the way she talked about the money changed between her two different testimonies. 
Oh, yes. And that's what I was pointing out last week. Like I was saying, the way she talks about it doesn't match uh, if you actually go back and check the facts earlier in the book that she so clearly gave this, you know, with this um, uh, obvious reference that this is a test, you know, uh, are you going to betray me or not? Um, I, there were there were several things that didn't check out when I compared that uh, in the past, and it was cool to see the. I don't know where this is in the in the uh, sections, but yeah. Uh, but anyway, like the 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 defense attorney here really does kind of take Katarina to town. <laughs> uh, seven thirty two and seven thirty three. If you're looking for a specific. Oh man, did we miss it already? Yeah, uh, it was because it was at the end of the money chapter. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, but he had some kind of harsh words <laughs> for her, and I, maybe it's even in a different place still. Well, but... he talks about her testimony again later, so you might yeah, be okay. a later one. Um, so we might not have missed it. <laughs> okay. Um. He has some words for Smerdyakov in the chapter we're talking about. Right. Yes. You want to talk about that? Yeah, that was um, that was assertive. <laughs> That's uh, not a way you can get away with talking about somebody who just killed themselves. Usually, but uh, seven thirty-eight is that how, the section you're referring to? Yeah, that's where he really comes out and talks about um, and. Uh, just what a character Smerdyakov is. Right. Um, you know, that he's not feeble-minded, that he's ambitious, vengeful, burning with envy, um, hated his origin, first Russia, dreamed of going to France, um, actually comes out and says, you know, the illegitimate son of Fyodor, which is, it seems like, you know, in the town and even in our group a little bit, it was kind of like a, you know, like a taboo kind of a thing. Um, right. And this speech really, um, you know, I've kind of thought it, but just really burns in what a weird and complex and despicable and pitiable rich character Smerdyakov is. He might be the most, like, depthful character in the book to me. Um, you know, he's despicable, but he's, uh, and he's hate hateable. He, he's a, it's a deep picture that has been painted in the book about him. I, I really agree with you, Aaron. I think this little assessment of Smerdyakov's character is probably one of the most penetrating in the book, you know, um, and and getting a lot of angles because, you know, not hardly anyone else has kind of appreciated both. I mean, we've certainly had people who have encountered him and and the gross side of him or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and been sort of infuriated by it. Um, I like that the, the prosecutor, or the, why do I keep saying that? Uh, Fedyukovich, the defense attorney kind of immediately sees through his naive guilelessness or whatever. Um, and sees a very calculating and complex mind, you know, uh, uh, but also he really does get to the origin of a lot of um, the motivations for this character that we don't see in other sections, like just how much it uh, burned him to be, you know, so aware of being the sort of bastard son born of a, you know, stinking Lisa Veta and, uh, that's built into his name, you know. Um, and I thought the insight into we don't get anywhere else such a penetrating insight into how he related to Fyodor. We've gotten the sort of faithful servant thing, but here the idea is suggested of kind of, you know, burning resentment and envy for his brothers. And you don't get that anywhere else. I mean, you never have them called his brothers anywhere else. Um, and and it, you suddenly 
kind of see how this idea might have taken shape and you're like yeah okay if you're born the illegitimate son forced into servitude your whole life while your brothers even though they're mistreated but they get money and inheritance and you're sitting there making soup you know for a jerk <laughs> who's your dad um like and you can't call him your dad <laughs> right um I also found it um, really interesting here in this picture shows where Smerdyakov would have had motive of his own because right. when he heard Smerdyakov's confession, he confessed to the killing, but he laid it all on Ivan. That's true. Said, you told me to do this. I was following your orders. I was doing what you wanted. And that's that's very different than this picture where he would have had his, his own own motive and makes me wonder more about his conversation with Yvonne from a few weeks ago. Well, that fits with calculating, right? I'm, uh, mm -hmm. it's your fault I did this, right? Yeah. And I mean, you know, he's, it, it, this just paints such a good picture of the, of the type of character. And I, I've, I've never seen it done so well with like, thinks is smart but thinks they're smarter and is pitiable but is reprehensible like it's um there's just so many dynamics and directions with Merdikov just on this page that like it's true throughout the book but it gets clarified wonderfully here yeah and we've talked about that maybe like when he was first introduced and we got some of his backstory then um about how much you hate him but also pity him and and i think this completes that portrait in a you know kind of a book ending kind of way um and yeah it does make you think back to those conversations with Yvonne um and uh you know what when is he telling truth and when is he lying <laughs> um how much does Yvonne have to do with it and I think Yvonne still has something to do with it um maybe planted the idea that you can get away with this I think also, this links up with uh, those visits to Smerdyakov where the doctors are like um, saying, well, he's clearly crazy because he's learning French vocables, you know, in, in Russian typography. Um, but that totally lines up with this idea of motivation that he always wanted to leave kind of backcountry redneck Russia and go to a civilized place like France. And so it's like he's carried out his his plan. He's it, it makes you wonder about again, like we were talking about, why did he end up committing suicide? Because um, he's gotten away with the crime. He's got the money to start his new life. He's learning the French vocab, um, and uh, you know, there's an interesting speculation. And again, you know, just to defer to Aaron, I think it is definitely worth pointing out like you can't talk like this about people who kill themselves um but but i guess the you know the attorney has to really um because this guy did just kill himself on the eve of the trial and is that not a little suspicious um and i thought there was an interesting discussion of the psychology of that suicide because the the prosecutor has said well look he had enough why wouldn't he have enough moral courage to tell people in the note or whatever we kind of talked about that last week and here the uh, defense attorney is like uh because there's a difference between repentance and despair and you can kill yourself and still be throwing middle fingers to everybody you know um and uh hating them more than ever but you're just in a point of despair not a point of remorse so uh I think what's interesting is that for the first time, the defense attorney has shown us a bit of plausible psychology for why Smerdyakov might be throwing a middle finger to Dmitri. Um, <clears throat> he might have had a lifelong resentment. You know, Dmitri's gotten all this inheritance of money, and he's got nothing. Um, and then, too, Dmitri is just generally a jerk. And has been bullying him lately. So, 
you know, why not leave the crime pinned on him? Like, you know, he's been sort of a spoiled brat from Smerdyakov's perspective. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up the bit about the suicide because last week when I was reading the prosecutor's speech and it got to the part about like, well, he was wrote a suicide note. Why didn't he confess then? And I basically yelled out loud at the book as I was reading it. Like, that's not the same thing. So I really appreciated here, as you just said, that, that the defense attorney pointed out uh, despair and repentance are two totally different things. Um, I wished that he had actually gone a step further. And, and I feel like he's implying that, you know, despair can be malicious and implacable, suicide. He may have at that moment have felt twice as much hatred for everyone. Like you said, just throwing the middle finger. But I kind of wish that the defense attorney had like explicitly said he might have committed suicide because he didn't want to have to come and testify and get caught. He didn't want something to come out in the trial that would have actually pinned it on him because i feel like that's a like yes on the one hand as as you said aaron you know you're not supposed to talk about somebody who committed suicide like this but on the other hand like you know in modern crime procedurals and whatever i feel like committing suicide right before a trial is like a pretty decent sign of guilt and that that should have been more explicitly said yeah it raises questions and even the prosecutor i think he made some comment of like, despite this happening, and despite Ivan bringing up and pointing to Smerdyakov and bringing this money and all this sort of disorder that it caused, he made some sort of comment in passing of like, well, you decided to keep going with the trial this afternoon. As though maybe that should have halted the proceed proceedings for right. a minute, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. He doesn't really make that direct appeal he makes a, a I guess a decent case for why it could have been Smerdyakov mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then I have to say this is sort of getting into the end of this chapter and then the next chapter too but it kind of spills over I kind of wish that the defense attorney had stopped there with pinning it on Smerdyakov because this whole bit on, on 741, the very end of, of the chapter we're on. Um, wait, I just had it. This is only a supposition talking about suppose for a moment that I agreed with the prosecution. This is only a supposition. I repeat, I do not doubt his innocence for a moment. But let it be so, let me suppose that my defendant is guilty of parricide and then hear what I have to say. And then he goes on about how he wasn't really a father. And like, I get that, but I think it undermined his whole argument and I wish he had left it off. Well, yeah, that's why the chapter is called an adulterer of thought. <laughs> um. Does anyone want to raise any other points on, on this No Murder Either chapter before we discuss that? That would have been a good place to stop, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of liked how he flipped the uh, argument of well, if Dimitri didn't kill him, who did? You know, um, like that it's all been pinned on Dimitri because they really can't find anyone else to pin it on, you know? Uh, yeah, like he flipped the prosecutor's argument of it's stupid to blame Smerdyakov. He's only pointing that finger because there's no one else to blame. And he's like, well, that's the only reason you're pointing the finger at Dimitri. Right. And and yeah, he makes this this pretty good little uh, argument about isn't it at least suspicious um, that uh, 
Smerdyakov had this fit of falling sickness exactly on this day. And I don't think he's aware that, that, cause, that he doesn't have Ivan's testimony that Smerdyakov had even basically prophesied that this was going to happen on this day and had sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. like I can, And also had told him that he knew how to fake it. If you remember that, like he told Yvonne that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think the pro- the defense attorney is aware of that. Um, but it's it's perceptive of him to point out, you know, hmm, curious that this happened on this day and that he committed suicide on the eve of the trial, you know, yeah. and that there are several people that are pointing to him, you know, and that... Uh, Yvonne formerly believed in his guilt and suddenly reversed. And Alyosha suddenly remembered this kind of relevant fact about the amulet. Um, it, it does feel like this should have been, been cause for more questioning or you know investigation it's kind of frustrating that they just plow forward and the jury doesn't seem to weigh this really uh so let's move on to 13 i guess an adulterer of thought uh it sounds like you guys are very unhappy with this turn here like Okay, I've done my best at, at making an actual defense, and now let's just now let's go for the. I, I feel like this is the move that everyone's been waiting for, all the ladies in the audience, especially apparently. You know. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's dramatic. They're waiting for this kind of like eloquent moment where this complex psychological case gets, you know. Um, gets a proper treatment by the new courts and the enlightened, you know, ideas of the new age. Um, And so I feel like this is where he completely plays into that um, expectation. Uh, And it's like, well, let's say he did kill his dad, but was he really a dad? You know? (laughs) Um, And I guess the point there is, therefore, dispense of the stigma like you have to punish him because it's a parasite which is worse than a normal homicide and if this were only a homicide based on these facts that you have you'd be more prone to you know be like okay there is a reasonable doubt let's let him go even if maybe it's not we don't know for sure maybe we're letting a guilty man go but it it really does feel like he goes so far here um, that it completely undermines. It almost feels like he just gives it away. It's like, all right, he is guilty. Whatever. Like, <laughs> who cares? Let him go. <laughs> right. And I just, oh, it made me so mad. <laughs> like here, he did a good job in the past two chapters of building this case that wasn't Mitya, and then his most impassioned, dramatic appeal to the emotions is, well, even if he is guilty it's fine and that's a terrible argument (laughs) well he was i mean i think he was trying to go for what it is to be a father and what it is to be russian now that we are evolving and those Um, arguments are good i just think it belonged in a different place sorry to interrupt i'll let you go (laughs) well and, and it's again even though it's been um sort of brought up jokingly earlier he is more or less making the fit of passion argument um, you know, and and attempting the insanity thing here, like, well, he couldn't control himself because his dad was so terrible. He didn't mean to kill him. He just swung the pestle, and it happened to kill him. You know, um, and uh, well, who wouldn't swing the pestle at such a crappy dad? You know, <laughs> um. I agree with you, Jenny. I I, I feel like it was heavy-handed um, in its um, in its execution, but I, I do I do see his point. It's a good point, McGee, that he's uh, looking for the um, doing this, you know, kind of rhetorical 
uh, examination of of like fatherhood and modern father modern Russian fatherhood and so on um, to be like, yeah, um, it was warranted. <laughs> he had it coming. <laughs> um, since Micah isn't here, I guess I have to, you know, bring up what I expect he would say. <laughs> um, because he's been the one that keeps raising the idea of fatherhood as a theme in this novel. And here you have maybe the most overt uh, statement of that question. Like, what does it mean to be a father? Um, you know, 742, uh, his blood who begot me, his blood who loved me, his life's blood who did not spare himself for me, who from childhood ached with my aches, who all his life suffered for my happiness and lived only my joys, my successes, you know, uh, that's that's what a real father is, according to him. Um, and uh, then that's really contrasted with uh, with Fyodor. What is a father? I was asking just now, top of seven forty four. I exclaimed, this is a great word, but gentlemen of the jury, one must treat words honestly, and I shall allow myself to name a thing by the proper word. Such a father as the murdered old Karamazov cannot and does not deserve to be called a father. Love for a father that is justified by the father is an absurdity. Love cannot be created out of nothing, you know. And then he goes on to this, fathers provoke not your children. And I don't know, it's like, even though this is, I think, a misguided... Um, attempt to be like, well, let him go even if you think he's guilty. He he makes some good points in here about uh, about fathers and children and, and uh, you know, um, the crowd really seems to eat it up, you know. <laughs> uh, they're, they're applauding and <clears throat> I think there's several outbursts in this chapter. He who begets is not yet a father. A father is he who begets and proves worthy of it. <clears throat> um, and I think this is the type of thing, question that Mike was raising earlier. You know, like, there is another meaning, another interpretation of the word father, which insists that my father, though a monster, though a villain to his children, is still my father simply because he begot me. Um, and is that legit? The lawyer says, but this meaning is, so to speak, a mystical one, which I do not understand with my reason, but can only accept by faith. That, by the way, sounds a little bit like Yvonne talking about justice, God's justice <clears throat> in rebellion. Um, I heard a couple echoes of Yvonne in this whole speech, actually, um, in, in the Rebellion chapter. And the other one that really jumped out at me, I don't know, do you guys remember in, in Rebellion when uh, the very first story Yvonne tells about basically an abused child is this, um, I can't remember if he's French or Dutch or something like that, but it's basically a boy who's sold to some shepherds and brought up you know, sort of in the wild, um, like a wild beast, they say, and all he ever knew was, you know, having to fend for himself and tend to, and then he ends up becoming like a drunkard and a murderer and um, converts in jail, and then they have to execute him anyway. You guys remember that one? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's, there's a phrase uh, in the defense attorney's speech somewhere in 743, um, that uh, talks about Dimitri basically being raised like a wild beast and never getting any... Oh, that's right at the top. My client grew up in God's keeping. That is like a wild beast. Um, kind of in the context of that story where he never received anything or any love from anyone except the one time Harrison Stuba bought him some a bag of nuts or whatever. And I thought the, the language kind of echoed that rebellion chapter 
of the you know the child brought up like a wild beast out uh, among the sheep and i was like oh so that applies to dimitri too and he is kind of that stormy personality that's now on trial for murder it's kind of a bit of a parallel there i didn't catch that at all Yeah, I had some similar thoughts reading this because uh, like everybody else had said, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense as a strong defense. Uh, you know, it might make some sense to like try to lessen the sentence if he were to be convicted. But to me, the uh, what I was getting out of this chapter was... Um, maybe a sense that the use of the word father was echoing back to not just um, Fyodor, but God. Like, are we are we saying that uh, you know God is if you're raised in God's care, you're raised like a wild beast? It, like, if God is uh, being raised in God's care, is being raised with an absent father? Uh, hmm. are you justified in rebelling against God then? Um, so I, I feel like I was getting similar uh, hints about those references back to the rebellion chapter. I'm glad you have pointed that out. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that angle, but uh, I think that's a totally legit layer Uh if you're raising the father question, you know, and, and think about God in this context, like, oh, wow, you know. <laughs> if we've all been abandoned and neglected. And <laughs> um, I definitely, I'm glad you guys are bringing up the rebellion parallels because I didn't catch that. I did think all throughout this chapter of um, how Mike has constantly been bringing up um, the whole subject of fatherhood throughout all our talks. Um, I do have a question. I don't know if anybody else has been going through all the footnotes. Um, but in the middle of 744, the quote, fathers provoke not your children. Um, that's, a, that's a Bible verse, Colossians 3.21. And it says, um, Fichukovich adulters, in quotations, by what he omits, see Colossians 3.20. And I didn't have a Bible handy when I was reading this, and I meant to go uh, back to those verses. Did I, does anybody know? Or should I go to the I other room and grab mine? No, I didn't look that up, but I have, I have one handy, or we all have Google. Uh, but I think yeah, I, I guess I could have Googled it. I didn't think of that. Uh, here we go. Colossians 3.20, you say? Um, yeah, 3.20. I, I don't... I, I feel like it, 21, but... <laughs> it seems like an exaggeration to me to say that he adulters that by quoting... I mean... I'm, right, well, that was a quote from the footnote, so I was... <laughs> All right, so uh, Colossians 3.20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. 21, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Um, you know, so it's it's clearly supposed to be a, a, a kind of mutual, um, uh, right. mutual. symbiosis, whatever, you know. And since the prosecutor only, or the defense only quotes half of it, that's lopsided. I, I just don't, I feel like that, that footnote almost oversteps like it's it's not i don't feel like that's out of context necessarily you know um yeah. like this father certainly provoked his child his child intentionally and completely you know like i mean how flagrant is it to um use the last remaining part of your son's inheritance that you're denying them to try and win away uh <laughs> the woman that they're going for. I mean, there's nothing more insulting um, or scandalous than a, a father competing with the son using his inheritance for the bait to trap the same woman that they're both going. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous.
Also gross. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of footnotes, I was confused by the next one that somehow the words metal and brimstone <laughs> yeah. were biblical words that made a merchant's wife afraid to hear them. Yeah, I don't know what it means by metal. Like, I can't think of any prominent metal quotes in the Bible, but... <laughs> <laughs> I was a little confused by that one too. I'm like, huh. But evidently if you're a if you're a Moscow merchant's wife, that's a significant, you know <laughs> taboo. <laughs> Another thing I found interesting on this chapter, um wait, I think maybe that's not it. Thought it was at 7:45, but then I read the rest of the passage in that. Um, I I don't know. I'm not going to find the passage, but I'll just say what I had to say. Yeah, yeah. Just um, go ahead. <laughs> uh, that there's this idea also in this chapter of um, instead of condemning this man you should forgive him and you should show him mercy. And that would be, um, you know, that would be the Christian thing to do. And that would be a good Russian thing to do. And I don't, I don't remember right, the, right. the passages exactly. And I thought that was, um, was very much a callback to some of the ideas we that were discussed earlier in the book about, um, kind of the new courts and, and, you know, science and reason versus, you know, religious courts and, you know, showing mercy and, and then some of Zosima's ideas about not condemning, but forgiving. And it just, I don't know, it seemed to kind of tie a lot of like different things from different parts of the book into that particular um, plea that even if he's guilty, you shouldn't uh, condemn him. Yeah, and, and actually a big part of that was, I believe, Yvonne's article on Ecclesiastes, Yvonne, report, yeah. right? Um, where he was saying, uh, you know, there's sort of no better way to punish the Russian soul than, you know, like, um, make it guilty before God or whatever and forgive them. And I, I don't know, it was sort of like, there have been points, and I think Zosima, like you said, also examined that topic. Um, uh, about how sort of the, the church was the... Um, it, it had something to do with, like, I think Yvonne's argument was we excommunicate the criminal, don't, like, punish them, like, like cut them off from the church. And Zosima like completely contradicted that. Like they need the church more than anything. It's the only place left for the criminal, you know. Um yeah, I think those were they'll lose all hope. Um and so also um this argument from uh Fedyukovich here, if you want to punish him terribly, fearfully, and with the most horrible punishment imaginable, but so as to save and restore his soul forever, then overwhelm him with your mercy. That's page 747. That's actually extremely similar to Zosima um, and to his discussion of what the torments of hell might be, uh, which had to do with receiving love when you don't feel worthy of it or whatever. Um, this gets totally scoffed at and laughed at later by, you know, I guess the audience and, <laughs> but it, it's it definitely interesting to hear this thought coming from the mouth of the defense attorney, which has clearly been something that other characters have been circling around. Mm -hmm. And, and like you pointed out, coming at it from different, different sides to excommunicate or to forgive and welcome or um, but but all of those arguments say, you know, don't just throw them in jail. Like, make it 
a moral like between their soul and God guilt and not, I don't know, guilt against the state or however it would be secular. Yeah, well, um, I, I want to read a passage that I actually highlighted in, in the margin. I wrote Zosima specifically, okay. um, and it's here again on 747. Okay. It's really interesting to hear this coming from the defense attorney. Um, this is after he says, you know, what I just read before, if you really want to punish him, like <laughs> shower him with mercy and his, his soul will, you know, this will kind of weigh on him. Um, he says, uh, is it for me to endure this mercy for me to be granted so much love? And am I worthy of it? He will exclaim. Oh, I know, I know that that heart. It is a wild but noble heart, gentlemen of the jury. It will bow down before your deed. It thirsts for a great act of love. It will catch fire and resurrect forever. Um, there are souls that in their narrowness blame the whole world, but overwhelm such a soul with mercy. Give it love, and it will curse what it has done, for there are so many germs of good in it. The soul will expand and behold how merciful God is and how beautiful and just people are. He will be horrified. He will be overwhelmed with repentance and the countless debts he must henceforth repay. By the way, this really does sound a lot like Dimitri's conversion he's undergone in prison. Um, and then he will not say, I am quits, but will say, and here's the really interesting Zosima phrase, I am guilty before all people, yep. the least worthy of all people. Yep. <clears throat> I underlined that as well. I was like, we've been introduced to this defense attorney out of nowhere, 750 pages into the book. <laughs> 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 We're reading 20 pages of his oration, and right before he stops, he says exactly what Zosima says and what... I, Guess is the biggest theme of the paper is I'm guilty before all. Right. Of the, I'm sorry, of the novel. I'm guilty before all. Yeah. In tears of repentance and burning, suffering tenderness, he will exclaim, people are better than I, for they wish not to ruin me, but to save me. Um, I, I think what's really... Um, so, I don't know, wrenching about this passage is this really does describe the spiritual journey that Dimitri seems to be going through. Mm -hmm. um, even though he's not guilty, we think, you know, um, he's not guilty of this, but he's realized how guilty he is of so many other things his whole life. Um, and so he's kind of coming to accept the lot he's given in this mentality, you know, um, and you really want the jury to listen to this because it would work. This totally would work with Dimitri. It's, I think, you know, I think the lawyer actually has a good, really good grasp of Dimitri's actual psychology and character. He really gets the two poles that he's torn between. And I think he really gets that impulsive desire for good he's just looking for a way in a moment he's found it in this woman like he's really really wants to you know kind of take this path and you just kind of desperately want the jury to give him the chance you know because i really think this passage could describe dimitri if he were set free you know yeah i can see that i guess i just would never have the kind of faith in a jury to <laughs> make, and maybe this is like all the like modern day crime procedurals and shit that I watch, but you know, like I wouldn't have faith in a jury to make this kind of a plea to say, even if he's guilty, this is why you should let him go. I like, I mean, I know I said this before, but like, I feel like stopping at like when you've torn apart, apart all the arguments and pinned it on Smerdyakov was the place to stop if you want the jury to buy your story. Well, I agree with that in terms of a good defense, especially if you're going to plead, plead innocent, you know? <laughs> right. And like when I say I hate this chapter, like I don't hate this chapter, like bringing up the fact that Fyodor was a terrible father is extremely relevant. All this religious stuff about showing mercy rather than punishment. Extremely re relevant. Extremely good. Terrible defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think you're making great points. I do think this made more sense in that culture and time. Um, That's quite possible. You know, to sort of make an appeal to their 
Christianity in this age where they're trying to be more humane and, you know, um, it, it's sort of where Christianity and progressivism meet there at this time period, maybe. And, uh, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's probably what you want to say if you pleaded guilty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pled? Is that, is that the past tense? <laughs> it's, um, you know, he's calling to their, yeah, to their Christianity, also to their, you know, that Russia can be better than this and better than its past, and we're not the backwaters, and we're capable of mercy and uh, enlightenment. Uh, I mean, I, I see that as, you know, a reasonable plea to make to people of, you know, who might have, you know, uh, an inferiority complex <laughs> about yeah. who they are and where they've been from. And, and this just suddenly occurred to me, but uh, as, as there was a sort of clear parallel to that case of the French or Dutch shepherd boy, who, by the way, I think was called Richard. I can't remember. Um, but if you remember, like he had this big Christian conversion in prison and really repented and, you know, was being educated and all this stuff. And uh, uh, the whole society there was like, and this was Yvonne's point, about how sort of ridiculous it was that he'd had this horrible childhood and upbringing and had been raised like a beast, uh, but a, a society was still holding him accountable for the wrong deed he had done, even though he converted. And they end up like, yes, Richard, yes, go to the Lord. Like, we're going to kill you today, but, you know, go to the Lord. You know, <laughs> do you remember that? Um, so I feel like there's a parallel here where he's sort of making that appeal. We don't have to be the Dutch who killed a repentant criminal, right? Um, or, you know, um, I feel like this is trying to be the enlightened Russian version of how we respond um, instead of that um, juridical approach. Even if you have a change of heart, you still have to pay the ultimate consequences or whatever. <clears throat> That makes sense to a degree, but didn't didn't the end of the prosecutor's speech essentially have the same thing, like from the uh, from the other side, the other end of the stick, so to speak? Probably um, <laughs> about in order to for Russia to be feared, I don't know, not feared, respected by the rest of the world, and yeah. I mean it's the whole thing about the troika and that last, like right. basically he was saying in order for Russia to be not seen as redneck backwater or whatever, we can't let a parasite go free. That's absolutely the argument he made. Um, and uh, I think Fedyukovich takes up that language and addresses it directly, is that, I guess that's the end of his speech. Yeah. Um, but I think what he's making here is a different argument is like, well, actually we're Russian and we have the right kind of Christianity and this is how we would handle this. Not like that. Um, you know, like I, and I, maybe I'm straining too hard at this, at this comparison no, think, story way back, but. I think that makes sense. And I think looking at it as, you know, again, the defense attorney taking the prosecutor's words and purposely using some of the same phraseology to make the opposite point is purposeful and probably a good speech technique. Yeah, well, and there's also, I mean, very much in the air of Russia is this debate about whether they should be more like the European nations or whether Russia has its own inherent... Um, traditions that are actually superior and good in their own way. So you had the Russophiles versus kind of the, you know, uh, yeah. Um, and so that might be like a little bit of a part of this back and forth between these two guys as well. I don't know. Uh, okay. But that's an underlying layer of just the cultural climate back then. You know, is Russia sort of a, a different thing than the rest of Europe and its orthodoxy makes it, um, uh, gives it sort of this uh, rich soil and profound roots, even if it's gone astray or whatever, but it can return to its tradition? Or is it like, 
well, this is all backwards garbage and we need to <laughs> jettison it and become like the rest of Europe. And, you know, so that might be a layer of tension that explains these different views too. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just found uh, the the section I was thinking about where um, I thought was a very telling phrase from Fetjukovic about Katerina. Um, this is 743 at the bottom, and I double highlighted it. Um, uh, I said earlier that I had not ventured to touch on my client's romance with Miss Verkovtsev. Yet I may allow myself half a word. What we heard earlier was not testimony, but only the cry of a frenzied and vengeful woman. And it is not for her, no, it is not for her to reproach him with betrayal, because she herself has betrayed him. <laughs> if she had had a little time to think better of it, she would not have given such a testimony. Oh, do not believe her, no, my client is not a monster. Um... I, I thought this language very much echoed what Dimitri has been saying for a while about Katerina, that woman of great wrath, you know, and uh, the uh, defense seems to sort of share that view here. Uh, it's interesting that he points out she's betraying him here. Um, I guess I think it's somewhere else that has been like pointed out earlier that she flip flopped her testimony. I think Katarina is really an interesting character to think about in the situation. You know, um, she's going through so many different <clears throat> emotions. She's initially trying to save him, then she's decided to destroy him, and then she basically dissolves in uh, in tears. And I wonder if he's right. If she had had a little time to think better of it, she would not have given such testimony. What do you guys think? I doubt it matters because it seems like the emotions are so high that that's what was going to happen there. All this built up frustration just <laughs> finally coming out at Dimitri. Yeah. I I still think it has a lot to do with um, Yvonne's brain feverish testimony. Right. Like if Yvonne didn't have brain fever and was able to testify coherently, I don't think Katya would have flown off the handle the way she did. Right. Um, Trying to save him from accusing himself. Yeah. Like I definitely saw that as her impetus. That's my reading anyway. Um, I mean, also pent up frustration and anger and wrath at Dimitri. Sure, that was part of it. But yeah, I guess the question is, will she regret what she did in terms of Dimitri? How does she feel about him? I'm not sure. <laughs> I reread that a couple of times. I didn't know. I mean, there's a easy frontline reading is like, be pissed and with good reason, <laughs> like. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I have done way less, way, way, way less to make women mad than not send 3,000 rubles. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I understand why she's mad. Um, but, but as far as like her intent and her character, I, I, from that paragraph or whatever, I didn't, or part of a paragraph that should be a paragraph, uh, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> really get uh, what she is or why she is about this. I mean, is this about Yvonne? I don't know. Or is it, you know, um, just how brilliantly upset she is with um, Dimitri, not just for betraying her, but for also dragging her out into court. And like, you know, is this last straw stuff where now it's not just whispers, but she's in front of everybody having to be, you know, woman in front of the other woman in front of the town right just, <laughs> and, th and that's where it it feels a little extreme and unfair to me for the defense attorney to say she herself has betrayed him it's like whoa like okay initially i mean she has contradicted her initial testimony so she's given two different testimonies but is that a betrayal you know like <laughs> no and that's what i had thought you know 
she was or he he did what he had to do with Smerdyakov, um, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, unseemly to talk about at that point or whatever in terms of social norms. I know why you did it, but that, that one I didn't understand why. Um, yeah, and, well, maybe that's it exactly, is it's a rhetorical move here to, you know, throw some shade on the lady who gave the most damning testimony of all with that letter, yeah. right? Can we trust everything she said? Because it's been, and he brought this up, maybe it was earlier. Can we trust everything she said? Because now it's clearly driven by wrath, you know. Um, I mean, the, the defense attorney is supposed to say the things that you're not supposed to say in, you know, <laughs> normal conversation in polite society. That's why they get paid what they paid and have the bad rap they've got. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's just about the fact that her second testimony, um, she was obviously emotional and wrathful. I think it's that it, he says somewhere, um, her second testimony contradicted her first testimony, which means if you believe her second, then the first has to be a lie. Well, if the first is a lie, why isn't the second a lie? You know, right. like. Right. She lied at least once, maybe yeah. more than once. We're not sure which time. There were high emotions. She contradicted herself. Like she just showed herself to not be trustworthy. As you definitely, woman. definitely have to say that as the defense attorney. You know, like I mean, she did give two very different testimonies. So, which one are you going to believe? And if you, you obviously can't believe both, can you believe either? You know, uh, or are they both? exaggerated in certain directions you know and like my personal opinion is that they're both exaggerated in different directions like she had a clear aim both times and neither of those times was it getting at the truth yeah right. unfortunately, the second time it it also <laughs> was dimitri's own letter I, and words so can i interrupt uh with something about micah mm-hmm he just said um, he had to take a family member to the ER and he started for missing the book club. So I would just start to pray mercy and blessing on him and his family member and um, let you know that's why he's missing us tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, that, I mean, his, it seems like his parents are older and not in good health. So I, I'm really sorry to hear that, especially if it's his, his own parents, you know. Um, have to say a prayer from after. Yep. Sorry to interrupt, but I just saw that on my phone. My phone lit up. Michael, we are thinking of you tonight. We are, we are definitely thinking of your themes and missing you. Very much. All right. We'll pray for him after, but um, just wanted us to think of them in the moment when it matters now. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for interrupting. There's this sort of really interesting, bizarre moment on the bottom of 745 where he's talking about this whole uh, idea of, you know, who is a father and uh, <clears throat> uh, this idea of mystical notions of what fatherhood is. Um, how should we decide it then? Here is how. Let the son stand before his father and ask him reasonably, Father, tell me, why should I love you? <laughs> father, <laughs> prove to me that I should love you. And if the father can, if he's able to answer and give him proof, then we have a real normal family. Established not just on mystical prejudice, but on reasonable, self-accountable, and strictly humane foundations. In the opposite case, if the father can give no proof, the family is finished then and there. He is not a father to his son, and the son is free and has the right henceforth to look upon his father as a stranger and even as his enemy. Hmm. <laughs> it seems odd to say, Father, why <laughs> prove to me why I should love you. <laughs> uh, there's some, something seems funny about that, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's kind of true if there's like no reason you can think of <laughs> family's kind of finished right there. I I understand the sense of what he's driving at in terms of like his dad's a monster <laughs> and the whole town knows this. Um, 
but I mean, it's a rhetorical argument, right? I, he's not trying to tear down the uh, essence of fatherhood and flip the family relationship. <laughs> 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 everyone must prove everything to everyone all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> now, part of being a family is that you forgive each other when you're flawed meat sacks who are trying their best. But <laughs> uh, I'm glad you said that. You know, that's yeah. really an interesting point in light of this chapter. We're talking about forgiving the criminal, but. Is there forgiving the family, you know? Um, how far does that go when your dad's a monster, right? <laughs> yeah, I had real mixed feelings about that passage that you just read. Right. Um, when I was going through it because and I didn't spend too long on it because I just wanted to get to the, the verdict and all this. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, like, I don't know, just just very much mixed. Like, like Aaron said, I understand the point he's driving at. I understand that there there is a certain point where relationships are broken, where the family ties, like, if someone actually is a monster, you know, in cases of abuse and cases of, I mean, there are lots of cases in the world in which people cutting family members out of their lives is probably the healthiest thing for them. I don't always fully understand that because I come from a really solid, close, amazing family. And the idea of like asking my dad to prove why I should love him, it's kind of absurd. But I think maybe it's absurd because it's obvious. Like, I don't need, like, a mathematical proof. Like, he's been a good dad. I've got a good family. So the question seems absurd. But I don't know. Like, I feel like it's it's hard for me to wrap my head around just because my family experience are not what so many people's are. And like Aaron said, you know, the idea that, yeah, family should include forgiveness. Like, nobody's going to be the best dad ever because we're all human and we all fuck up sometimes. But, you know, we do what we can and love each other. And and I think family is a strong bond. This chapter definitely feels like some rhetorical experiments where you're sort of trying out everything, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't, you know. And and like you said, I really think this sort of waters down. Like it, it seemed like he did a good job, probably the best job you could possibly do, in a case where there's so little favorable evidence. <laughs> like he actually raised some really good points. And it's like if I were a jury, I would weigh that stuff. Like, yeah, all right, that might create just enough reasonable doubt that I'm not 100 percent sure this guy is guilty, and so I I have to let him go, you know. Um, but then when you're like, well, <laughs> let's say he is guilty for a minute and let's just talk about how much his dad sucks. <laughs> so that, that really, I think that almost creates a backlash. Like you're saying we should yeah. forgive a guy cause he killed his dad. Well, no, this is parasite then. And we do have to crack down because that's, you know, just completely, against the natural order or whatever you know um it's worse than just a murder it's you know it's the worst kind of murder (laughs) and that's the whole point he was trying to make is don't count it as this but it's almost like he's in, in emphasizing that so heavily he's he's putting it on people's minds and you know (laughs) And this being the part of his speech when he got the most like impassioned and and emotional and, you know, bringing in the audience and the applause and all this business. I mean, that's the part of the speech that's going to stick with the jury when they go into deliberations and they're not really going to think about the first half of your speech. The handkerchiefs were waved. (laughs) What's that? Handkerchiefs were waved. Oh, yes. So he may have not been he may have not been impressing you, Jenny, but he was impressing the ladies of the town. I guess I'm not a lady then. <laughs> well, actually, I just want since you've made this point, you're uh, a lady of our town. 
um, that this is what's going to stick with it's. I mean, what he does end with is actually this passage that I quoted is very Zosimo like. Um, this act of mercy, you know, um, and he, he finishes with this idea it's better let 10 who are guilty go than to punish one who's innocent. Um, the and, quote. and he's making this case that the Russian courts exist not only for punishment for the salvation of the ruined man. And this is where he brings back that Troika image and counters it as the top of 748. Let other nations have the letter and punishment. Thinking again of that Richard story of the French guy. We have the spirit and meaning, the salvation and regeneration of the lost. And if so, if such indeed are Russia and her courts, then onward Russia and do not frighten us. Oh, do not frighten us with your mad Troikas, which all nations stand aside from in disgust. Not a mad Troika, but a majestic Russian chariot. <laughs> that sounds kind of cheap. Will arrive solemnly and peacefully at its goal. In your hands is the fate of my client. In your hands is also the fate of our Russian truth. Wow. You will save it. You will champion it. You will prove that there are some to preserve it, that it is in good hands. And uh, and then just the crowd goes wild. <laughs> really, the top of this page, like he just needed to have like the national anthem playing, and you know the flag <laughs> come up behind him. Right? <laughs> Anybody else picture that? Confetti. <laughs> right. Blue. Their, now, their national anthem is not exactly a celebratory song, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very Russian. <laughs> You are sad. It is dark. <laughs> my, my bishop of blessed memory uh, that sent me to seminary, his name was Job. And he used to joke about Russians um, like always being sad and depressing. And he's like, have you ever heard the Russian happy birthday? <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Children crying, people dying. Happy birthday! <laughs> well, there was a moment of hope here on page seven forty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're ready to move on to the next chapter, right? And the uh, the response here. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, what happens is, and I felt like this was a bit of disorder in the court. How does the prosecutor get to get up and, and do a bunch of blustering blowback, right? Didn't he already have his final argument? Like, what's up with this? <laughs> I thought the same thing. Yeah, it's very irritating. <laughs> Uh, a, another parallel to Ivan's rebellion chapter in the middle of page 749. Uh, this is this is the prosecutor. Why does he not ask that a fund be established in the parasite's name in order to immortalize his deed for posterity in the younger generation? And if you remember, um, Ivan proposed establishing a scholarship to the father who whipped his kid. Uh, brutally, I don't know if you guys remember that, but that. it was one of the earlier stories about how Russians have their own peculiar types of, you know, enjoying torturing the innocent or whatever. And it was it was the the birch branch. Hmm. <clears throat> He, he basically accuses Vedukovich of like um, conveniently extracting a few phrases from the gospel the night before <laughs> as though it's the first time he's ever like he did some digging to get some Christian stuff to trot out. Um, he basically accuses him of, of you know, making that play while 
being a fake Christian, not like a real one. He's sort of calling him out there. <clears throat> There's definitely a war between these two of ideas. Mm -hmm. He like objects to the way he referred to Jesus. Like, right. He called him this phrase, but not this other phrase. And I'm like, okay, every time you refer to Jesus, do you have to use all the phrases that describe him? Because that would take like 10 minutes at least if you just listed all the names that Jesus had. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what he was insinuating there is that the defense attorney's phrase did not in any way make a claim to divinity. It's just sort of the wise teacher sort of idea. Uh, he, I think he's calling into question, is this guy really a Christian? It's very, you know, kind of dirty, dirty moves there, you know. Um, and doesn't the, uh, doesn't the defense attorney respond to this too? Yeah, in the middle of 750. Candidate uh, Sinister Intent said that in preparing to come here, he had trusted at least that this tribune would be secure from accusations dangerous to my person as, as a citizen and a loyal subject. Oh, like yeah. And then the judge, him too. for some reason, like, considers that foul play, you know, like, you're taking... I, I didn't understand why the judge sort of considered that response out of bounds, you know. Uh, I think where this chapter actually gets in interesting is when Dimitri finally speaks, um, which is the uh, page 750. Um, the defendant himself was given the opportunity to speak. Mitya stood up but said little. He was terribly tired in body and in spirit. The look of strength and independence with which he had appeared in court that morning had all but vanished. He seemed to have experienced something that day for the rest of his life which had taught and brought home to him something very important, something he had not understood before. His voice had grown weaker. He no longer shouted as earlier. Something new, resigned, defeated, and downcast could be heard in his words. And he talks about his judgment having come. He maintains his innocence. Um, uh, he talks about having learned a bunch about himself that day. Even thanks the prosecutor, he said much about me that I did not know. I don't know if that's being sarcastic or. <laughs> um, is that sarcastic or earnest, you know? Uh, I, I didn't even think, uh, that's a good point. I didn't think about the sarcasm that would fit with his character, but when they talked about how defeated and tired he was, I was like, okay. It, I, I think we're maybe meant to take that as earnest, actually. I read it as earnest. Yeah. Um, because the whole speech, it seems like this change has come over him. Uh, you know, he's saying, if you spare me, I'll pray for you. I will become better. I give you my word. I give it before God. And if you condemn me, I'll break the sword over my head myself and kiss the broken pieces. Um, And what does he mean by this? But spare me, do not deprive me of my God. I know myself, I will murmur. That kind of reflects the uh, discussions of the courts and the criminal and, you know, that we talked about earlier. Uh. I think it's pretty interesting, again, one of the best parts of these court chapters is overhearing the conversations that happen in the audience. And so here we get these nice exchanges of different opinions between the crowd. We also find out it's one in the morning by this time, yeah. <laughs> an hour after midnight. To which point, I'm actually surprised we've spoken this long about such a small section tonight, you know? Uh, in econ, we call this induced demand. 
<laughs> we were going to spread it out no matter what. <laughs> yeah, it's, you can create more lanes to the highway. There'll just be more cars on it. It's not going to help traffic. <laughs> well, we started our discussion really late tonight, too. We did. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, it seems like there's been a lot to talk about here. And, and it, I mean, it's not one in the morning now. It's one in the morning in the courtroom. In yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> At my house, it's only 1130. But... <laughs> There's so many people here saying acquit him. He should be acquitted. And more to the devil being brought up for some reason, yeah. <laughs> oh, devil. You say? I don't know what to say about this, except it made me really sad. Uh, yeah, so it, it's like this almost just extra dramatic buildup while you're sitting there waiting for the the decision. You hear the crowd, and the crowd is all murmuring, acquittal, acquittal. And then it's just extra devastating. And the jury comes out says almost nothing and it's guilty 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 on every charge you know uh and then and then some chaos ensues you know a lot of people kind of gloat and are very, very pleased the ladies start a riot yeah <laughs> Um, I liked the phrase about the ladies. Uh, they jumped up from their seats. They must have thought it could all be redone and reversed on the spot. <laughs> um, and then there's this really interesting moment. Um, at that moment, Mitya suddenly rose and cried in a sort of rending voice. That's actually a very gospel sort of... Um, phrase right there uh on the last and greatest day of the feast jesus stood up and cried out in a loud voice like you know is is a gospel phrase but uh i swear by god and by his terrible judgment i'm not guilty of my father's blood katya i forgive you brothers friends have pity on the other woman <clears throat> A piercing cry from Grushenka from the back. And and this sort of ominous last phrase, yes, sir, our peasants stood up for themselves and finished off our Matenka. <clears throat> um, that's where I, th I think, he, you know, this backlash idea makes sense. Um, it was sort of too much uh, for the prosecutor or the defense attorney to ask them to consider he's guilty, but acquit him anyway. And it's like, nope. <laughs> the peasants aren't aren't ready for that idea. <laughs> Even though there were four officials on the jury, too. Who it was part part earlier had probably never read a single book in their lives. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He'll get a 20-year taste of the mines. <laughs> like Jean Valjean. Yeah. Um, minds that's uh it, you know interestingly enough in the orthodox liturgy there's actually a, f a a petition um for like 
captives and um, those serving hard labor and those in the mines or something like that. There's actually a f phrase in the prayers <laughs> for people working in mines <clears throat> in the liturgy. Well, it's a depressing end of the chapter, and and technically to the book, right? <laughs> yeah, like, this is the end of the book, except the epilogue. One hopes the well, epilogue isn't quite so depressing. Well, I was, I was gonna say, like, the I read this, and it's, um, the book starts with Alyosha's our hero, and I get to the last, uh, the end of it is one of the brothers going to the mines for twenty years. I don't know what happens in the last 20 pages, but I'm, I'm still not sure why Alyosha is the hero. Yeah. So um, I think he's I, I'm hopeful that I'm going to read something great in the next week about that. Yeah. I was going to say, I think Alyosha is the hero of the second book that never got written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, that would also make sense. This is supposed to be the backstory to that. Um, and that's yeah, something we can talk more about maybe next week with the epilogue, but um, I'd really like to interview a professor who knows as much as can be known about, you know, sketches or projections for what the sequel is supposed to be. Um, there's a few things that are known, but I read a few articles, and they're all by a crazy professor with kind of weird alternative theories uh, that the most important thing to Dostoevsky was the to understanding the novel and, and the motivations of all the characters is to understand um, their various um, medical problems. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that falling sickness is so important because Dostoevsky himself suffered from it and uh, that Alyosha is supposedly hysterical like his mother. And it's, it's all, it's, it's not yeah. very credible when you start reading about what the next book was supposed to be from this guy's perspective. And he seems to have a very minority view of what this book is to begin with, you know? <laughs> Well, I guess we can wrap up this week's discussion um, because I don't know what else to say. And it's just so depressing. <laughs> um, I I did want to. I was thinking that this week's discussion might be a little bit shorter than some have been, um, and so I wanted to bring up a topic and uh, not about this. <laughs> specifically, but about the future of our group, really. Um, and uh, um, if you guys have any thoughts or hopes for uh, should we continue, and if so, how or what, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. David and I discussed that a little bit when he was here. Mm -hmm. um, do you we guys... want to discuss that on the air, or? Um, I mean, we can. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, so that, I was going to ask that question too. Like, in in case anyone's following along, like, you know, are there other things that? Uh, where do you go from reading Dostoevsky, Brothers Karamazov? Um, and uh, I'll just, I guess, for the sake of, in case anyone ever watches this video, <laughs> if we would like to go on further. Um, I think we could reap the benefits of having done such intense work of reading in basically a hundred page great Russian novel. There are certain things that you can read after this where you kind of reap the fruits of it. Um, and you wouldn't get as much if you didn't read this first. Uh, one of those is uh, The Brothers K by David James Duncan. 
Has anyone ever read that? Have you read that, Jenny? Mm -hmm. I remember uh, you guys talking it, about it all the time, but I didn't read it. Yeah, we read it in college, and it's um, it's sort of a story of a similarly chaotic family of four brothers who somewhat resemble these characters. It's set in uh, the 60s and 70s. It's a baseball family. It's a baseball novel. It's hard to describe what it's about because like this book, it's sort of about everything and cultural changes and faith and big questions. Um, and, and it's definitely sort of echoing themes and characters from brothers Karamazov, but in an it stands alone as a totally independent read. It's fun. It's not as heavy. You know, it moves a little faster. Uh, but it's also big. <laughs> I'm really not up to tackle that immediately. <laughs> I was going to say, my only request would be something shorter <laughs> um, for, the for the next book. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing that I've thought about is... Um, when Melissa used to teach this book at the Oregon Extension, um, they would actually stop after reading Rebellion and Grand Inquisitor, and they would read uh, a theology book by David Bentley Hart called The Doors of the Sea, which um, is a sort of extended reflection on um, how to make sense of evil in the world or you know not to make sense of it <laughs> um not to explain it away natural evil and human evil and and that book actually examines the rebellion chapter in detail as you know sort of the case that you really have to deal with or you know the the, the maybe the best framing of the question in, in literary history um and it's only about 100 pages long, the whole book. So that's, um, you know, sort of like continued reflection on the rebellion themes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I've thought about that would be interesting is for anyone who's who's read Silence by Shusaku Endo or, or would want to see the movie, I thought it would be really interesting to compare the Inquisitor in that book with the Inquisitor in this book. Um, so those are some ideas I've had, but I will say, uh, I personally at least want to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I'll stop the recording, having given my ideas, uh, and uh, we can just continue to discuss. But yeah, if you're interested in Brothers Karamazov, check out those other suggestions. Brothers K by David James Duncan, Doors of the Sea by David Bentley Hart, Silence by Shusaku Endo. I think they're all kind of um, correlated. And with that, we'll sign off. <laughs>